ready. So my next guest is... So Martin Petersen, good uh, good afternoon and welcome to the EHI. Thank you for your time. Thank really, you. really happy uh, that you could be with me today. Um, little presentation. You're a member of the European Parliament since 2014, so on your second mandate, so quite a senior guy already in the European Parliament. Um, you're a Danish Liberal member of the Renew Group and uh, also serving on the on the Committee for uh, Industry Research and uh, and Energy. So a very interesting committee, especially today. Um, and today you're also Shadow Rapporteur for the EPVD, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. This is not your first time doing this, it's actually your second time, so you really must be into it, <laughs> into, into buildings. How come, actually? Is this your passion? Well, uh, no. Well, passion, yes, because it, it is so important in, in terms of all the issues uh, that we have uh, at the table right now, uh, not least with Ukraine and, and dependency on, on, on Russian gas imports. So. All of a sudden, such a technical thing as a buildings directive is becoming security politics. Uh, yeah. Adding to this, uh, I find it, uh, given the importance of buildings, I mean, bear in mind that buildings uh, uh, stand for like 40% of the energy mm. consumption in Europe. So it is so important what we do with buildings in terms of climate, now also security, but yeah. in, in every facet of life. Uh, so, so buildings are extremely important. So yes. Uh, in that context, it is a passion. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I agree with you. It's uh, I think for a long time, buildings have not really been in the spotlight, uh, but it is an issue, and it was even for climate reasons only. Now we have an added, uh, an added uh, problem, another issue with energy security. But it's something that has not been looked at so much like today. Uh, but it has become certainly a very important issue. And I think for us, uh, looking at it also from the side of the heating, let's say, dimension of buildings, we really see that there is a lot to do. Uh, most buildings in Europe are old, uh, they were built before the 1960s, and the heating systems inside those buildings are also old uh, and most probably uh, very inefficient. So uh, for climate reasons, for energy security reasons, uh, for just for the well-being of the people that live in them, they, they, they need to be replaced. And one of the things, uh, you know, typical and, and also a little bit strange about heating systems is that some they are something that, you know, you have in your cellar or hidden in a cupboard, you don't really know how mm -hmm. efficient or not they are and you need a specialist uh, technician to you know, install them or maintain them or, or install them. Uh, so when you actually want to buy a new one, then yeah. you need the advice of a professional uh, that does it. And I think what we are seeing today uh, is, is that uh, with the acceleration that we need to, to have in order to replace those, those old systems, we need more and more installers. And I know that this is an issue also for you, you've, you've, you've worked on this or you're, uh, you're, you're raising this also within the legislation. How do you see, how big is this problem actually? Well, but absolutely, it, absolutely. It, it is a, a huge issue and, and, and the impression I get uh, speaking to colleagues from all over Europe is that it is a, a problem in all member states. I mean, the lack of qualified workforce in, in this context is, is a real impediment in, in terms of, of the renovation and upgrading in, in terms of energy efficiency in, in our building stock. So it is a, a real issue. I mean, obviously, uh, patterns would, would change somewhat depending on, on what country you're in, but overall, big picture, it is really a, a, a big issue. And it's not only related to buildings, it's also related to all other aspects of the green That's transition. Right. So we, we really have an issue in terms of workforce on, on, on having enough skilled people out there uh, to help us out basically. But so, isn't this also an opportunity actually because of course a shortage of uh, skills and unemployment in a lot of yeah. member states, uh, yeah. not, not, it's not a typical of one country also, there is an opportunity you know, to attract new people into this profession. After all, these are you know, good jobs. There are local jobs. They pay well, yeah. uh, and they have a long-term view. How, how do we attract new people to this profession? Oh, That's but, but, the uh, question, probably. Uh, just to give you an example from my own country, mm. Denmark, where, where we, and I, I was not aware of this until recently, but in, in, in Denmark, you would have uh, technicians that were specialized in heating or cooling, mm. uh, not both. 
uh, even though there are big overlap in terms of technologies yeah. and applications and, yeah. and uses. So this is just a, a tiny example from, from, from my own country and I would, I would bet that you'd have similar examples uh, all over. So it's, it's, it's quite complex because it also feeds into issues and questions like traditions and culture and how have you develop your educational system. But you, you're absolutely right. There are tremendous opportunities in, in this sector. And again, given uh, the necessity of renovation and, mm -hmm. and renovation wave and, and all the, the means being invested into buildings these years and in light of recent events with, with the energy spike in, spike in energy prices, yeah. I mean, it ought to be even more attractive to, to go into this uh, sector. So uh, I hope and I sense also change is coming in this because people are also seeing the opportunities in, 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 in yeah. this sector. So Yeah, uh, yeah that's true. I mean, there's, there's, but it's interesting what you're saying about traditions and, and, and local differences. There are differences, but there are also similarities. I wonder to what extent is this, you know, a European issue that we can solve because the technologies in the end that, that we want to have installed are pretty much similar across Europe. Yeah. And or or is this only a, a, a member state? If you want to get into the you know policy making, is it only member states, uh, national governments that have to do something? What can Europe do? So this is going to be perhaps the most difficult principle to deal with mm. in in the upcoming negotiations on the buildings directive mm. because you have member states out there. You also have colleagues in European Parliament that would say that. This is to be left for member states alone. This is not a pan-European issue. I, I, I have the opinion that it is a, a European issue. And I think there are benefits stemming from further harmonization or standardization of some of the technical appliances also. Mm. Because that would imply that you could have people working and crossing borders, working in other countries, uh, creating a more transparent market basically for the in installing and applying some of these new technologies, new products, new appliances mm -hmm. that are out there. So, so in my opinion, there is a need for going down that route. I'm not talking about harmonizing everything, but I, I think this is a road that, that we have to walk at least a couple of steps in, in terms of also creating more transparency, thereby hopefully also make it impossible for, for people to, to, to cross borders, to, to work, to, to study, to work in other countries and, yeah. and, and assist in this green transition. Yeah, and when you're talking about crossing borders uh, and, and then you, you, you mentioned it earlier also the security issue, I'm starting to see, you know, how this issue of skills, because we're talking about skills and getting our workforce up to the skills that are needed for the technologies of the future, is this just a skills issue or is it start, does it start to become even more political? Is it a security issue? Uh, I heard you mention it before. Or is it uh, end or immigration? How, how, do we, how do we label it if yeah, we can? Yeah, if we can, because uh, I think it cross borders also in terms of, 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 of political issues because it's, right. it's a combination. Because you also see, and I think you also have to be open about this, in some member states you have competition issues. Where, where you have certain industries sort of protecting the way they used to do things mm. uh, and, and maintaining very specific standards and not letting competition in. So we need more transparency and also more competition. And this is why I think some sort of standardization on some of the issues that are on the table of matter might be beneficial for all of us. Also, having more people coming to work in other countries, uh, which requires, again, some sort of transparency, knowing what's going on. So if I have qualifications coming from one country, mm -hmm. it would be good that these qualifications were I'm also valid. applicable in, yeah. in another country. So if I had an education in, in Italy as an as, as installer, it would be great that these qualifications were also acknowledged in, in my own country, in mm -hmm. Denmark, yeah. one way or another. Yeah. And this is difficult to do, and, and you'll also meet some resistance yeah. in member states yeah. in acknowledging this out of fear of, of competition also. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's of course interesting. I'm, I'm wondering, because you talked about colleagues uh, in the parliament and, and you are a you know, member of the Liberal Group, is, is there a liberal approach uh, to, to the skills agenda? Obviously, liberals have always been very attentive to education as a way of you know, developing yourself and your potential, freeing yourself. Uh, yeah. Is there a liberal approach that you see can be applied here? 
or maybe it's something universal? I, no, I, you know, I, I would be happy to boast and say that there is a liberal <laughs> approach, but I'm sure you'd find colleagues from other political groups who would make the same points. But, but it, is, it is an important issue for, for, for liberals to, I mean, basically to empower the yeah. individual. And how do you do this? Well, you do this through education, among many other things, but education is obviously extremely important. But also, coming back to the point on competition and transparency and, 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 and avoiding lock-ins and vested interests, so I also think there's a big and important point to make this mm. in, in this regard, saying that we need more transparency in a very technical field. Uh, so it's very easy as an individual to g get completely lost in this technical yeah. uh, mumble and, 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 and rumble uh, out there. So transparency is also uh, important, also for the individual. Yeah, yeah, that's true, and I agree. And I think this is a I'm 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 getting as passionate as you on on, on this issue <laughs> here in the, you know, all the facets <laughs> of the story. Uh, but uh, no, thank you very much for uh, this short uh, talk with me. It's been very interesting. Uh, I hope for you as well. Um, looking forward to the next talk and uh, happy to host you again uh, in our office whenever you want. My pleasure and so good seeing you in real life. Thank you again. <laughs> all the right. best with your important work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are you having other guests apart I, from me? I, I might have other guests, but probably not as good as you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.